thank you everybody so much for coming and I apologize for the delayed start. We can, in this case, legitimately blame Obama for this. <laughs> He's apparently commuting during rush hour. So you want to blame Obama? Do so. <laughs> My name is Eli Lehrer, and I'm the president of the R Street Institute. On behalf of our directors and my staff, I'd very much like to welcome all of you to our offices. I'd also like to make a confession. I personally am a huge Star Wars fan. <laughs> when I grew up, I was inseparable from my Star Wars lunchbox. I had Empire Strikes Back sheets on my bed. I saved my allowance for four whole months so that I could buy the big Millennium Falcon. And it is still in my parents' basement, but I wish it were in mine. <laughs> I'm thrilled to be spending an evening talking about what I think is the greatest sci-fi franchise. Woohoo! <laughs> Before we begin and introduce our moderator, I'd like to share a few of my own thoughts on the Star Wars franchise. In some ways, it's unusual that a think tank of the political right, like our street, would be hosting an event on Star Wars at all. After all, current series maestro J.J. Abrams is among the largest political donors in Hollywood and gives only to Democrats. Star Wars creator George Lucas was a heavy donor to Barack Obama. What limited commentary on current politics exists in the series, as we see it on screen and in the novels, is almost entirely an excuse for cheap attacks on the political right. For example, think about the Viceroy of the Trade Federation, the evil Viceroy of the Trade Federation, named Newt Gunray. Get it? Stop. <laughs> no? <laughs> But the Star Wars universe does offer a lot to interest and intrigue those of us who prize liberty, those of us on the right. And let me talk about just a few of those things. First, let's note that it's made quite clear that the Empire's tyranny is not just political, but also economic. I'd like to show you a very brief cutscene of the first movie. This is the first time that Luke actually hears about the rebellion. This didn't appear in the final version, but it was shot and was in the script. Let's watch it. See, so quiet. <laughs> I didn't come back just to say goodbye. I shouldn't tell you this, but you're the only one I can trust. See. I may never come back, and I just want someone to know. What are you talking about? I made some friends at the Academy. When I figured the police are one of the central systems, we're going to jump ship and join the Alliance. The Rebellion? Quiet, I'm not as big as the media. I'm quiet, I'm quiet. You know why I have to bury her? My friend has a friend on Best Dean who might help us make contact. I know it's a long shot, but if I don't find them, I'll do what I can on my own. It's what we always talked about, dude. I'm not going to wait around for the Empire to draft me into service. The rebellion is spreading, and I want to be on the side I believe in. Yeah, meanwhile, I'm stuck here. They gave you a chance to get off this rock. You're going to the Academy next term. Mm, not likely. I had to cancel my application. What for? My uncle needs me. Oh, no, I'm serious. The same people have been doing the They didn't even the last bits of actors. Oh, my Luke. They're off with the old off old colony, Sam. It was one blaster. I know. But we've got almost enough evaporators to make the place pay off. I have to stay one more season. I can't leave them now. What good is all your uncle's work if the Empire takes it over? You know, they've already started to nationalize commerce in the central systems. <laughs> it's long before your uncle's just a tenant. Slaving for the greater glory of the Empire. No, that's not going to happen here. You said yourself the Empire will be the... So, as you say, <laughs> the series clearly recognizes that freedom is not just a matter of political freedom, but also one of economic freedom. In fact, the event that sets 
the events of the series into motion in the chronologically first movie, the not so great movie, probably the worst of the series, but nonetheless chronologically the first, is a trade blockade. The Star Wars universe recognizes that commerce plays an important role in freedom. It isn't the whole of it, but it is an important part. The role of intellectual property in the Star Wars universe, moreover, offers some very interesting lessons. In the expanded universe, which I realize is now called Star Wars Letters, yeah. <laughs> We find out that the Incom Corporation was the initial developer of the X-Wing fighter. Under the threat of nationalization by the Empire, Incom executives absconded with plans for the X-Wing and distributed them around the galaxy under a de facto open source license where the Rebellion and others could change modify, and learn from the design of the X-Wing without imperial or even corporate control. The main software used to control X-Wings, moreover, is contained in R2 astrobeck droids, which themselves are owned and controlled by individuals. The X-Wing controls are another important example of open source. They are adapted directly from those of the T-16 that Luke Skywalker used to bullseye womp rats on <laughs> And that is how he could fly an X-Wing so quickly after first being introduced. Let me be straightforward about this, and this is a serious point. Without open source, without a right to repair, without the ability to own the software, in the form of astrobeck droids, as is proposed in Representative Blake Farrell's Yoda bill. Without these things, the Death Star would not have been defeated by x wings Yavin 4 would have been destroyed, and the rebellion would have been stopped in its tracks. A libertarian attitude towards IP is absolutely vital if we're to stop planet-destroying weapons. <laughs> this is necessary to national security. <laughs> There's a lot more we have to learn from Star Wars. And I'm delighted that we're spending an evening discussing it. The movies, the stories are wonderful. In that context, I'd like to hand it over to our moderator, Benny Johnson. Mr. Johnson is the creative director of IJ.com, Independent Journal, my favorite and the vast conservative news aggregator, as well as a growing, important, and influential source of excellent original content. He's previously worked for both National Review and BuzzFeed. It's my pleasure to have him and to welcome all of you to the Ars Creative Institute. Benny, <laughs> Benny, may the force be with you. <laughs> <laughs> oh, <my goodness. laughs> Hello so much. Thank you guys for coming out and braving like terrible traffic. Um, I'm here in a bathrobe uh, for your viewing pleasure. We have a lot of other wonderful people here for your pleasure. I'm going um, to I'm gonna introduce, uh, well I don't really have major introductions, but I think we can just go down the line and say who we are. Uh, I'm Benny Johnson. I work with, <laughs> oh see I thought it was open source. <laughs> I'm, I'm Mike Godwin. Uh, I, I work here at uh, R Street. I'm Director of Innovation Policy and General Counsel. I'm Trevor Burris. I work at the Kano Institute where I do constitutional law, constitutional history, legal history, and legal philosophy. I'm Emily Zanotti. I'm the digital editor of American Spectator where I fix people's sentences for a living. Beautiful. <laughs> and we're going to talk about Star Wars and politics and all the incredible fit places where they all cross over. Um, to begin, this isn't really a panel because Star Wars is something we all share, something that George Lucas kind of didn't figure out in the prequels. Uh, so this is like a thing that I want everyone's interaction with. That is not us like describing to you. Most likely you guys know more about Star Wars than us, or at least little facets of it. So uh, as, a, as, a thought, as a thought process, concept here, I would like for people to yell out the Star Wars character that most reminds them of Donald Trump. Chewbacca. Jar Jar Binks. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
Darth Vader. Anyone else? Oh, oh, Jabba. Yeah. Boss Nass. Boss Nass. Very nice. Jabba. Who's Why Jabba? Who's giant cat? Can't really understand it half the time. <laughs> Who's a little of math as a rat type yeah. character? Salacious yeah. Crumb. Salacious yeah. Crumb. <laughs> <laughs> Anybody else? There's one more really good one out there. All right. No, not for me. I just like. I want people to be able to yell and like make this all, this is all us together, like, right? Talking about this. So please like at any point, like feel free to add your comments or your thoughts on this. We'll jump right into something that I think is a very important Star Wars versus modern day society crossover, which I think is actually our first slide. Is Han Solo the first Uber driver? <laughs> <laughs> I have the following case, have a look. What you might not have noticed in the <laughs> is these important logos that were there. This is what he does when you say you're going to Arlington, okay? And that's search pricing. Uh, <laughs> this really important, like, search pricing uh, goes to 1,000 credits. Um, seven, seven 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 regular 10, credits. Credits. Yeah. Good lord. <laughs> Uh, the course, <laughs> the course, he has to decide whether Han Solo is actually a legal transport person. Um, panel, is Han Solo an Uber driver? Well, so the, the smuggling issue is important because he, in some of the extended universe stuff, which is a, again not a heretic, but some of the extended universe stuff, he once was at the Imperial Academy and did fly. They call him Captain Solo. That's what a dog figure calls him. Uh, but then he gets into smuggling. Now, smuggling, of course, is not per se, from my perspective as a libertarian, it's not per se wrong. Um, if you think of Dallas Buyers Club, for example, or you know, or you, with the Liz Taylor story that came out recently, same type of thing, um, or getting people around uh, in their own car against an existing cartel. And if we seem to think things about the empire and the use of the trade federation, we probably suspect that they're control on trade. And this is a big, we don't know exactly how the empire is funded. Um, in a various way, so uh, tariffs could be a big part of this. So their control on trade is probably quite extreme. We so know people the like tariffs are oppressed. Exactly. We know tariffs so, so for Han Solo to getting around this existing cartel, it makes him something like the government. There is an export control issue related to smuggling. I mean, I think that uh, obviously, uh, if you have an empire with strict rules and tariffs, they'll often use their authority to to prevent goods of various sorts from being shipped from planet to planet. Yeah. The thing is, though, is that usually, like, you can kind of gain the assumption from a new hope when he's, like, first talking to Obi-Wan and Luke in the cantina that he doesn't always transport, like, humans explicitly. It's yeah. Spice. So, yeah, it's, it's usually, like, items or some yeah. kind of cargo. Yeah. So, isn't there, like, a new thing like Uber where they'll, like, bring you items? Yeah, uh, yeah. Totally Clink, Clink brings you alcohol, for example. Yeah, it was on a day delivery. Yeah, it was on a day delivery. Yeah, it was on a day delivery. Yeah, it's like, he's, like, a I'd say he's maybe more of like a clink driver or like an insert for, item. Well, well, some people would use Han Solo to argue for more regulation because, you know, he shot first. <laughs> and we'll get to that. Emily, any hot well, takes? There's, there's also the question of how he relates to the war on drugs, correct? Because Spice is basically what he's running out of the Kessel Run, basically. And, and so, you know, he's... <clears throat> Unless your Uber driver is uh, also smuggling cocaine, I'm not really <laughs> sure exactly where it relates in, but he does he does openly defy the laws of the Empire, and that's how he makes all his money. So, the, speaking of the Empire, next slide. <laughs> the Death Star costs... This is my <laughs> okay. Is the Death Star a military-industrial complex boondoggle? Really? Because it costs 2.86 quintillion dollars based on a Stanford study. Uh, <laughs> and yet the government makes it completely open to... Is that well, look, like, this is, the, the, <laughs> thing about, the thing about the Death Star that I think that really bothers everybody <laughs> is why the Death Star is clearly a failed approach because uh, it has a, a back door. <laughs> Oh my god, what is what is this? Oh my god. 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 Oh my
I always thought you had Jedi mind. Yeah, it's yeah, just good. You're middle of the attack. Hello, <laughs> Hello Josh Norquist. <laughs> you will join our rebellion. Exactly. Josh Norquist is here to answer the very important question How does the Empire raise so much money to build and buy $2.38 quintillion dollars worth of Death Stars? During the Republic period, period of the Republic. They said there were thousands of planets uh, under their governance, which means you could have a very low tariff structure uh, and still raise quite a bit of money. But during the period when the empire took over, clearly we know they had smuggling, so tariffs were too high. Or smuggling Han Solo wouldn't have a job. Job of the Hutt wouldn't have work to organize. And clearly during this period, various planets went into revolt, like we did when the British Death Star was being annoying to us. Mm -hmm. British Death Star. <laughs> British Death Star. <laughs> what is the a marginal tax rate in the Empire? <laughs> well, it must have been lower in the Republic, which didn't have the revolts. And also and didn't have a standing so, army. Supposedly, and, and to fund a standing army, you needed higher rates. Yeah, supposedly under the um, old Republic, it was a 15% income tax plus tariffs. So, how did you know? <laughs> I read about it because did you call George Lucas last night? <laughs> somebody had said something about the Federation, you know, uh, cordoning off Naboo, and obviously that was a, a precursor to allowing Palpatine to become head of the Senate, but th that prior to them enacting the sort of Federation regulations about Naboo, that it was a 15% income tax rate plus tariffs. But, I don't know what Steve it was underneath, <laughs> <it's a flat laughs> <tax. laughs> underneath the um, underneath the empire rule. I suspect it would be much larger because we know even like with the moisture farmers on Tatooine, they were taking their goods and giving them back in excess rather than allowing them. Oh, the yeah. Betty Encyclopedia guy. I was saying, uh, <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Norquist, uh, I'm, I'm agreeing with your, your premise of that. Like, obviously, Job of the Hutt's. Uh, crime empire, empire or syndicate became a bit more widespread once the empire took over. But Java was in business even when the Republic still was around. So taxation under the Republic may not have been that much different from the imperial taxation system. Taxation even in a Republic is too high. It pays to avoid it, the taxes. But any movement towards higher in the U.S., the colonies, the British colonies, prior to 1774, taxes were one to two percent of GDP. Uh, the British were talking three or four, and we took the guns out. So it's change in the wrong direction that gets rebellions. By the way, there's a strong argument I think that in the deleted clip for the Second Amendment, which is that and you know that with a, a single blaster you can hold off all the sand people. Oh, yeah. yeah, interesting. <laughs> yeah, interesting. <laughs> and also just for general insurgency. They, they, they do go single file to hide their numbers. <laughs> <laughs> if, you're, if you're on the Second Amendment point, that's one of my areas of specialty. It is interesting that a lot of people will ask me if I bring up the right of rebellion, say, oh, you think people will have a huge uh, opportunity to chance against the combined forces of the United States military. It's like, well, actually, insurgents have done a pretty dang good job against the United States military over the last 50 years, so you can in, in Star Wars too. You and can actually you do a lot to uh, resist uh, the insurgency. If you look at something that relies on government work, government you know, assessment, the Death Star was fatally flawed. You know, they, they it's a military industrial well, concept. Wait, 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 hold for a second, hold for a second. Zach, next slide. The Empire's pro Second Amendment <laughs> and concealed carry. I stand your ground. Yeah. <laughs> Here are some very like rock solid examples of how pro Second Amendment, how pro Second Amendment the Empire is. <laughs> uh, to your guys' point, there are a lot of guns floating around, and most of them are concealed. But that's because uh, Darth Vader could go like this in the bullet. <laughs> Yeah, but most people can't do that. And <laughs> Jedi's are a myth by the by the point of that. Right. So <laughs> that's not the main reason I'd be you know packed with people. No, it is absolutely pro Second Amendment. But it also could be the case that guns are illegal in private hands, and they simply can't enforce, as any government can, uh, such a such a commandment. <laughs> What's yeah. that? 
No, no, this is a this is a this is a this is a one one nine. This is our <laughs> <laughs> you play Battlefront, you realize that this is a. This is a <laughs> But I mean, I also we we mentioned this uh, maybe come up later, but uh, the stormtrooper equipment seems to be very very poor, which is its own question of whether or not the people have better guns than the stormtroopers, or that I just can't shoot those helmets. And that will come up. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. In many yeah, many different scenarios, the clone army. Han Solo is allowed to concealed carry. Yeah. Um, and it's accepted in that's accepted in Lando's home. Well, it's that's accepted it's very in the bar. In the bar. In the bar. Yeah. 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 I think Mike wanted to go back to the Death Star. Yes. I do want to mention the Death Star only because uh, it is an example of the repeated failures of government policy. Uh, that You build a Death Star, but if you build a back door in, it's just inherently insecure. That's a better metaphor for uh, encryption policy than I... I could have invented, <laughs> but then they they keep it. Then they then there's a Death Star too. So we have like a whole second war. But do they still want back doors? Yes, they do, <laughs> because it turns out that uh, you need you know Lando Calrissian to come in and and help blow up the second Death Star. See, I think that the Death Star is the F thirty five, and and it is the F thirty five. But don't forget the second Death Star. Star so the first Death Star diameter is one hundred sixty kilometers. The second Death Star's diameter is nine hundred kilometers. I mean, basically, this entire like, well, you know, this really rock bottom. Big, we got to go big or go home. Clearly, we did not. Yeah, literally, we did not build a big enough Death Star. <laughs> that was the reason it was a problem the first time. So we're gonna more. Go. <laughs> by the way, Han Solo, Han Solo is open carrying. By the way, big yeah, enough. That's true. Let's try to stay on. Let's enough. stay on topic. <laughs> so what we talk about. Stay on target. Screen, <laughs> screen so based on the screen questions, does anybody have uh, questions or comments for the? I believe you have a few. You, you right. can't can't make an argument for. Second Amendment with custom raiders because Luke has his has his hunting rifle and it does nothing. Now, using all of these clips, you can, but you can't you can't talk about it in terms of custom raiders in the film because it's it's not effective. It's not it's not it's not the way the movie actually goes. He tries to use the hunting rifle, it gets battered away. Next thing you know, he's on the ground. Well, he's using a hunting instead of a personal protection weapon. Also, it's in his car, so it's extension of the. Aye, that's true. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's like the Second Amendment doesn't guarantee that you always win. Right. <laughs> it's what? Yeah. Yeah. Thermal detonators <laughs> also. No, I, I mean, I think this is important though because it's part of a broader point, which comes up in me. Maybe you have a side about this, but Tatooine is not well in the Phantom Minutes, which I unfortunately watched a couple of nights ago. Um, <laughs> they say it's not in the Republic. Uh, and it seems like either a failed state or some sort of frontier. And, and he says to Anakin at one point that if it would have been, could they find that he's a slave? And she says the Republic slave laws, and if it would have been more than the Republic. So it seems to be controlled by the Huts. So at this point, you have the Wild West, you have the concealed carry, you have the open carry, and questions about you know, what you can do in a failed state, even subverting the laws as much as they don't exist. Well, ultimately, the sand people are just using the modern <laughs> staffs anyway. Yes, yeah. So. But I, I think it's true that, that Luke's practice with personal weapons certainly informed his mm -hmm. ability to, to blow up the death star. Yeah, absolutely. absolutely. Yeah. Uh, okay, so we'll go to the next the next question. Is the Empire fighting an unlawful <laughs> tournament? Uh, Zach, clip and clip. <laughs> I mean, these are some pretty deadly drones that are able to... You're right, it's it's a drug it droid. is a probe droid, but it is armed. Well, it arose by any other name. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, it, it seems clear. I mean, it seems clear that uh, yeah. if, if, you were not, if you're not committed to actually sending your own troops, there are a couple of choices. You can have clones, or you can have uh, droids, or you can have clone dro drones. You just put them action together, <laughs> yep. and, and really you have drone policy. Um, it seems to me because that that turns out to be more cost effective than putting troops on the ground in a lot of cases. Certainly, when you're taking out uh, individual uh, despots. So. Well, the, the question of drone policy only gets ramped up when they get offensive capabilities, and that I mean, it would be you know we have a lot of criticism of drone cap uh, our capabilities, but they're mostly based off of killing people. In this scene, they're looking for the rebel base, and they're sitting, which is on a bunch of hostile plants. They sent drones to these bases. Uh, it's a different drone policy if we're just merely, I mean, the U-2, it wasn't a drone, but it was merely a surveillance 
uh, apparatus to try and look at. I don't know if this yeah. droid was intelligent because that's, I think that there, there's a huge that's what I was thinking, is there's an individual some, rights issue if some, they're disenfranchised to intelligence. Oh, yeah. Aspect that's, of, that's like, aspect of facial recognition <laughs> software or something because it was not defensive. I mean, it was clearly offensive. They were just looking at it to shoot at it. Yeah. But you have, and the drone all of a sudden takes an offensive position, so it is a surveillance drone, but it has some sort of intelligence capabilities because it then and weapons. alerts uh, a large contingent of Imperial soldiers that that's what's going on. The probe droid does self-destruct. Uh, Ham says I didn't hit it that hard. Mm -hmm. So it is self-destructing, and its intelligence and its intrinsic intelligence doesn't seem to be that way since the Imperials, as you see Vader and his generals, analyzed the pictures mm -hmm. of the Rebels' field generator and their ion cannon. Yeah. So, thoughts? I saw a couple of hands. I was going to say that the, if we're asking if it's unlawful, the question needs to be is there some kind of law in place protecting? Because obviously, this is meant to be first and foremost a surveillance droid. Otherwise, it wouldn't have like self destructed after it was attacked, or whatever. Like, it's not meant to be like a hellfire predator, you know, destroyer thing. So, you know, is Hoth a part technically of the Empire? Is it fall under the Empire's laws? Are there people there that are being surveilled that should not be surveilled? Or, you know, a natural right Did they get a warrant <laughs> before they sent these probe droids? You know, so. well, you, I mean, I'd like to see the even warrant. if you're not a member yeah. of the. Uh, I think Revan Paul well, would have something to say. I, I just want to know if the, if the droid self destructs without an act of free will. <laughs> Or was it really just a, a, a directive? Because I think we come back to the issue of drone intelligence, of Army droid, droid, droid intelligence. I was you a, yeah. Oh, I was just going. I think you guys want to touch on a little bit, but just the discretion side of it. Um, you know, they they see the footage, and the generals are all skeptical of it to begin with, and the major's like, "Yep, that's where they're at. We're heading to Han." And so the sort of thing where there's. Well, he's the decider. <laughs> I actually, I should have brought it. I have a Return of the Jedi card from 1983 that has uh, Vader on it that says the decider. <laughs> it's so it's great. the discretion of the person watching from the drone station think, of, like, what is the target? Is it an actual target and all that? I think this is going to lead directly into our next question, which is, you know, what are the moral status of clones and droids? Because... I mean, if there were hashtags in Star Wars, you could really argue that droid, droid or clone lives matter. Um, what is the moral status of a clone or a droid? Yeah, this is a big one for me because I think it is the great moral blind spot in Star Wars that, that, uh, and, and Star, that George Lucas seemed to never really care about, especially because C-3PO. So there's different types of, uh, yeah. uh, there's different levels of this. So if you've been getting a fan of Minus again, which I unfortunately watched recently, there are some protocol droids that serve the Jedi in the room that they're waiting in, and they're clearly not charismatic, to say the least. They're just doing a program. C-3PO actively fears his death. He says, like, don't deactivate me, like, when, when, after he learns that R2 <laughs> ran away under. He actively says that um, he doesn't want his memory wiped. Uh, at the end of uh, episode three, he's afraid of having his memory up. And R2, whose memory is preserved, just laughs at him in face of this, because R2 is a real bitch of the entire Star Wars <laughs> universe. Uh, <laughs> my friends, he, just, he just laughs at everyone constantly. And C-Trip is like being basically... And yet they make it stable. Right? <laughs> they do. I mean, it's stable. It's, you know, I mean, I have a little bit like the honeymoon. It's a little bit like, like, the, honey. like, the, honey. Bit like the honeymooners. I mean, really, it's like, <laughs> like uh, or the, the Dickersons. So, uh, <laughs> Support droid marriage. So I think it's a huge problem, and I think it goes back, uh, Mr. Wikipedia. I'm just going to call you because you know uh, it's awesome. What was it? Uh, Fernando. Fernando. So the political structure of the empire is unclear, and the republic, and the question of whether or not you have individual rights guaranteed by the central government <laughs> within. As a constitutional scholar, this is very interesting. Before the Civil War, you didn't have individual rights guaranteed in the states by the Bill of Rights, um, and until they incorporated the Bill of Rights, the question of whether or not the interior planets. The planets in the Senate, how much the you know, Galactic Senate is able to penetrate and decide, oh, we're going to have a law against droid slavery, if they have that type of control inside the member planets of the Republic or the Empire, either way. I mean, the Empire is presumed to have that control. The Republic probably doesn't. Well, you do have episodes of the Clone Wars animated series where they get into clone rights, where some who decide that they are going to, you know, <laughs> they are sentient beings. 
So they touched on that, but they didn't get into that in the film because they just decided, for those of us who really loved it, we wanted to get into the I think well, droids are underrepresented in the Senate. Oh, absolutely. And there's also the question of how quickly they become sentient. I mean, you see plenty of droids represented throughout the Star Wars universe that are clearly not, but then there's obviously the, that rolls around the yeah, the little mouse droid, <laughs> and, and, and then you see something like C-3PO, well, what's the jump from a, an unsentient droid to a sentient droid? Is there a potential for that sort of development? And then if there's a potential for that sort of that development, then when does that sentience start to take root? So you have this sort of like long-term robotics question. I, I mentioned this question to Peter Zitterman the other night, and he said that, Said, well, no, dro droids are programmed to be to be servile and slaves. I'm like, I've heard this argument before. Uh, it didn't work back then, and it doesn't work now. <laughs> <laughs> I was gonna say, maybe it's already decided because you have you have C3PO who immediately, like, when he's bought by Luke in Episode Four, he's like, "This is my new master." Boom! Like, yeah, totally gonna start this person. So it's like voluntary. the laws. Yeah, it's voluntary though on C3PO's end. Like, he's not wanting to escape. That's Arthur. what a, a sold slave would say at the time well, in, no. in Virginia in 1840. That's my new master, and like, I, I can't I need to obey my master. But he has no, nothing within him that's like encouraging him to go, whereas R2D2 does. But I mean, R2D2 so he's still got still a program to go find master. Kenobi. I think yeah, everyone that reads R2 wrong. is the smarter most. <laughs> but, but then think about someone like, like, IG, I'm a nerd. IG88, <laughs> you know, the bounty hunter yeah, yeah. robot. Right. He's, he definitely has a lot of If anyone tries to enslave him, he will destroy you. Django style. Well, you could, I mean, you could do an, an individual assessment of the capabilities that, that give you rights. I mean, it's not much like different than the abortion debate, for example. Right. An individual yeah, assessment of how much you need uh, for, for this, uh, but it, it deserves to be done. Right. I mean, it really is kind of disturbing how much we laugh at C3PO's. Fear of his own death. Question in, uh, in, in those movies. In so in the prequels, Tatooine is not part of the Republic, but in the original trilogy, is Tatooine part of the Empire? We were talking about that previously. Oh, we haven't not, established uh, it. Um, well, Wikipedia only, doesn't know either. There's, so <laughs> there's obviously laws that allow the bar owner to discriminate against the droid by not letting them in. So maybe that. Could well, be but maybe yeah. bar so they're still in the civil rights act. Yeah. 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 Person. And there's no ultimate law enforcement. I mean, we know stormtroopers are on the planet, but there's a question of whether stormtroopers are there to keep the peace, or stormtroopers are there because the, they the could ejector just, pod landed on town. They could just be a projection of force into the area. So who's more deserving of rights? The the droid with a, you know, crazy personality, or the clone that's essentially a biological machine that stands in, that stands in the way of gunfire. I mean, all the rights is, is pretty black or white. They're both deserving of rights. I mean, the conscription is wrong, even when you invent the. But the, but the clones clearly don't have any personality. They stand there and they get shot. When that's what they do all the time. The extended universe, the clones do have to undergo sort of an um, indoctrination process. <laughs> he really wants to say something. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. That was fine. Couple of things. Stormtroopers in the original trilogy are not. Clones. Right. Yeah, that's what you're yeah, saying. Um, they are. They're. They're not clones. They're civil servants. <laughs> like you said, number two, the very first episode of Clone Wars that that aired in September of 2008. They they get into this because Yoda is sitting there in a cave with three clone troopers that are under his command. One of them's injured, and he tells each one of them to take their helmets off. Right. <laughs> <laughs> and they say to him, oh, no, 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 no. We all look, we He's all going to save space, you guys. Yoda says, yeah. No, through the force, I see that you are all the same. So, like, yes, I mean, they do have, they, certain, certain characters in the Clone Wars treat them as if there's a certain degree of humanity. Yoda right. does, Anakin does, Obi Wan less so, but. I, I think there's an argument. There's always sort of this assumption that the clone process wasn't exactly perfected by the time that they were starting to get the clones. Right, they're and evolving. And so that they did evolve. Well, they did evolve. And if your mother drinks when you're in the womb, so you still have rights. Right? <laughs> you still have rights. So, but there's also the um, conscription process that happens in, in the original trilogy, and then ultimately, like what we're seeing as, as the Force Awakens and into the um, into the extended universe. That there is actual indoctrination processes, and they're telling the stormtroopers they're they're picking people up off a planet, they're putting them in indoctrination chambers, and they're telling them the Jedi burned your family, they killed your brothers and sisters, and so they're actually, 
you know, they're not necessarily clones. They're actually actively like conscripted, slave, enslaved people. So I think that's a cult school. So like the, the clones, I think the whole idea that they didn't get the process correct from the beginning kind of begs begs that these uh, the clone troopers be given rights because they're not necessarily in not uh, in not indistinct individuals. Check your natural born probably. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. Uh, can we get a round of applause for Darth Narcos? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> What's the highest contract of the Empire? Uh, too high. <laughs> 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 well, I don't know. Well, that's the uh, I think we should jump next slide here. I think we've. Uh, <laughs> Isn't that why it's yeah. just the Space United Nations? Yeah. No. I, I see a lot of shaking heads. This, is, what, this is what's called the ungovernable right here. Right. This, right. The this galactic thing. senator conference. Somewhere in this is Dr. Watts. It's Joe's Jarrett. I have, I have quotes on this. This is kind of interesting. I'll these up here. So here. Here are quotes about the Galactic Senate uh, at different points in the movie. So and, and this is interesting too. So, so uh, Obi Wan, it's been my experience that senators are only focused on pleasing those who fund their campaigns. Interesting <laughs> campaign finance on my specialties. And they are more willing to forget the nice use democracy to get those funds. Uh, and one point, Palpatine says the Republic is not what it once was. The Senate is full of greedy, squabbling delegates. There's no interest in the common good. The bureaucrats are in charge now. Yeah, now but, like Palpatine, the, but Palpatine would say <laughs> Yes, he would. <laughs> but maybe because he's arguing but, for essentially for relegating the Senate. We cannot presume that, that Palpatine thinks he's evil. Like he thinks he's good. There is no no man wills the evil; they will the good. Aristotle. So he thinks what he's doing is good, and so he this is his real opinion. About well, needs but, to be but he actually well chooses the dark side. It's also known that the Sith lords, you know, they limit their membership to the rule of two, mm -hmm. and, and, and 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 as a, and they end up dividing even against themselves. Uh, so that if you're you know look if you're Count Dooku, you're close. You know, you're going to get killed. I would say that, uh, that, the, that the Galactic Senate is more like the European Union because it's a supranational state and they automatically elect the, the, the Chancellor who then becomes the Emperor and assumes a lot of authority. So he's more like from a member on of Belgium where it's just like nobody really cares about Well, them. there's this, that's right, the Senate in the Republic, I think, is is a little European Union like <laughs> because it's unfathomable to ordinary people <laughs> <laughs> trying to figure out how anything ever happens in the Senate. And there's no, not adequate documentation, it's not very accessible. Uh, there's some Sometimes royalty gets in there. We don't know how that happens. Yeah, they, uh, and they don't have a standing army either. They have to ultimately, uh, yeah. they either uh, uh, recruit people or else they create clones. That's it seems I mean. like, uh, what is, who came up with the term demosclerosis? I mean, this is the, this is yeah. this is this problem that this this is clearly the most insane attempt at federalism ever ever. And this is a galaxy, not a solar system, a galaxy of thousands and thousands of planets. All you know, you don't know how much this goes up. All trying to decide something democratically. I mean, first of all, can we just agree that it is kind of silly? I mean, I do have to defend. I mean, I don't defend this. Ninety kind percent of, of these people at any given time are asleep. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> just, they're just asleep. And what committee they're on? They're on, they're on. <laughs> My other question would be like. Since there seems to be like no regulations of people in mm -hmm. between, is the, is the empire actually, or I should say, republic at the time actually uh, open borders? Well, well there seems it seems to be porous. Mm -hmm. um, it does seem to be porous. So there seems to be some kind of fray over the borders. Again. It's definitely the best thing about the EU is the open borders part. But it, the, again, going back to what I was talking about, really, about the droid slaves, it seems that this, the individual pilots have. Most of the autonomy to determine their own policy. It is unclear how much they, they can determine their own policy. I do you look at Naboo, <laughs> when Naboo kind of, when they're trying to sort of elevate Palpatine, Naboo is closed off because Naboo's policies are no longer in line with the Galactic Senate, at least. So there's some, some sort of regulation there that encourages people to fall in line with what the Galactic Center, Senate wants you to believe, but it may not necessarily be a rule of law that goes down right to your particular level. Yeah, I think, that, I think that the Senate illustrates the, the movement of the Senate to, uh, uh, the movement of the, uh, of the Republic to the Empire re reflects uh, uh, Plato's Republic uh, and the criticism of democracy 
uh, where he says that because people act selfishly and demand different things from their government, it becomes disorderly, and then to get order, you ultimately find the impulse to speak well, up I, and have the have, as, as much as I hate this, this this parody of democratic rule or whatever it is, it is true that when the first movie open episode one opens up, there has not been war in the galaxy for a thousand years. So maybe Woodrow Wilson's League of Nations sort of came to fruition, and we figured it all out. Well, I think it's an interesting deal too of how you look at this and from you know, political body standpoint, oh, 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 <laughs> <laughs> and eventual and stuff, but then you also have sort of this balance between it and the Jedi having this sort of like super political role. Sort of kind of maybe, and then well, they're, 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 they're clearly have some kind of combination of moral authority and enforcement authority, uh, but it's also in, mysticized, so it's a little bit like uh, the federal law enforcement community, anyway. They're a little like the federal law enforcement community. Introduce Congressman Blake Grethel from Texas. Yeah. Well, uh, we uh, ran over after some procedural shenanigans today. Oh, perfect. We were just talking about what existed in this thing. <laughs> you got 430 you wanted to go with this. <laughs> you wanted to charge our beats to the Senate. Yeah. Is there one of your colleagues in this? Like, that's our colleagues. You don't want to answer. I'm not going to answer. We all know it's Louis Gohler's thing. You know, we, we, miss the, we don't ever see the Jar Jar Binks campaign. I assume that, that, that Jar Jar Binks was appointed to fill a vacancy. I feel like Nabu was just like, get him out of the yeah. planet. I don't care. It must have been a great moment, though, because in Nabu, you know, the Gungans are like this pariah class at the beginning until they fight the war. So it must have been like we got our first Gungan senator. It was a great, great moment of equality and of inclusiveness in Nabu. <laughs> that is going to start us down a dark path. Uh, so, <laughs> we're going to make everyone ready. I mean, he motions for no conflict. He basically destroyed the Republic. So, you think if you stand there, he's destroyed the Republic. He is literally the worst character in human history. You know, in the, in, yeah. in, in, if Jar Jar Binks, you send him to the Senate to get him off the planet because he won't do any more harm, <laughs> what he does is he goes to the Senate. And, and triggers the events that lead to the uh, uh, <laughs> the chancellor, really the chancellor of superpowers followed by <laughs> really authorization of the use of middle of growth force for Before we jump here to the next <laughs> one, uh, uh, like the uh, Congressman, <laughs> is the United Nations like the Galactic Senate? I think they're definitely uh, about as functional. <laughs> <laughs> All right. One more thing. Quick point. So. Jar Jar makes the motion for you know no confidence to kind of put Palpatine into power. Both Jar Jar and Palpatine are from Naboo. It does not hurt Naboo. He's representing the interests interest of the people of Naboo. It does not hurt Naboo to have the most powerful figure <laughs> in the galaxy come from their home planet. In, in representing theory, the interests of the people of Naboo. In theory, yeah. Yeah. That's what Huey Long was doing too. <laughs> <laughs> All right, next, next, next question. So I bring in the state. <laughs> Should the Jedi be tax exempt? <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh, there you are. Where do I send Lois Lerner to collect? <laughs> Let's discuss. Do, do, do we think that Jedi have incomes as such? It's a great question. I don't know how they're money on property. property you know? This is not my restaurant that we were seeing. I guess now the midichlorians are sort of out of the picture, but there's a certain argument to be made that really? Jedis are not self-selecting, that, that you are born with sort of a talent that puts you into this specific class. Well, early on, they're actually agents of the state. Right. Yeah. And yeah. You, as a result, you typically can't tax agents of the state. Yeah, that's what McCulloch was wrong. Yeah. <laughs> but they're regularly referred to as religion in A New Hope. Oh, yeah, we're hokey religion. The old religion. religion. <laughs> that's also oh. something that can be revisionist history uh, in episodes four, five, and six, that it was a religion, when in reality it actually was something else before, but that's just kind of what they call it now because the emperor doesn't want, it kind of is a way to discredit it. This is something my, my 
because I think yeah. that they're just religion. I think they violate the establishment clause if they were put here. But like <laughs> uh, me and my colleague Aaron Ross Powell, who's a way bigger Star Wars fan than I am, is hard to do. But he, uh, he, he. I said it's a religion. He said, but the difference is, is that the the force is true. And I said. Well, yeah, that's what everyone in every religion thinks is the case. Well, they can actually move mountains. Well, they can actually heal people. I mean, if it becomes a huge thing, and the force is sort of a scientific thing, and the midichlorians sort of yeah. support this. Are you saying that they're actually... Is, Lucas, is, is, is Disneyland... Like, yeah, George Lucas says the midichlorians will not appear in episode 7, 8, 9. Well, that so was in his like original draft. The, 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 the idea of right? manipulating the midichlorians came along sort of when he got the opportunity to rewrite the series in 1, 2, and 3. But now in seven, eight, nine, they're going to. No, that's what the that's not what the Star Wars mm -hmm. the, the book says. It says that midichlorians were in his first draft. Yeah. But they were never meant to be the cause of the force. They were just meant to be indicators that you were a force user. <coughs> so. Yeah, but Anakin has a high midichlorian concentration. The highest. <laughs> yeah, the highest ever. Twenty thousand. The thousand you know, and he's the, the amount of trivia you guys know. <laughs> it's way over I know. He's like he, and he's just an obnoxious so, kid. So the so the yeah. Jedi have a giant temple. There, it's in the capital city. They clearly are part of the political conversation. Deeply affected. In one, two, um, and three. They yes. Have squat yeah. in. Right. They have one, three, four, five. So yeah. one, I mean, they get no, no, no. And by seven, they're just a myth. I guess they built the they built the temple uh, uh, on Coruscant on top of what had been the Sith temple. <laughs> well, that goes back to the old Republic. Isn't that right? Yeah. See, yeah. I need someone to validate that, that. that I'm not before in the out. dark times before the Republic. Yes, it's, it's we also we already <laughs> talked about the Roman Empire almost of this. The dark time before the Republic. Yes, the Sith control the universe and all this kind of stuff. And so yes, I don't know if that's canon. I don't know how George. Well, I always wanted to send him a note saying, this is how you spell mitochondria. <laughs> <laughs> mm -hmm. Next week. So do you see any organizations like the World Bank and IMF, their employees are, are tax exempt? How would you guys uh, compare and contrast their value and service to society to the Jedis and the galaxy? Well, I hope the IMF can't force children. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, technically. They, 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 uh, uh, well, look, again, going back to what I said, like as much as you want to criticize the Republic for being sporadic and overrepresentative and bogged down in procedure, it was a thousand years of peace, which apparently was the fault of the Jedi. Oh, the, the credit. The Jedi. Yeah, the credit. credit, the credit sorry. The credit. Yeah. We, oh, we, the we like peace. Like, you know, the keepers of peace and justice in the galaxy. Not so. great for me. <laughs> so <laughs> so I don't think the IMF does that, so, uh, so I'll go with the Jedi. <laughs> Shouldn't the argument that the Jedi aren't really a religion, but more some, like a special forces unit or something like that, where it's a type of skill or some type of abilities you have, that, that it's not like a religious thing, and that it's something owned by the government as essentially a combination in, like... You, you almost see it as a King Arthur's court. I mean, I think that's kind of the... Uh, the, the motto for it, or maybe part of the uh, inspiration for it, they are actually called uh, Jedi Knights. There's a, a, a mystic Merlin-type element uh, to it. I mean, I think there's some uh, some similarities there, certainly in the way, uh, in the inspiration. Well, it, you know, I mean, I think that there's there are elements of there are elements of uh, you know. What I remember most vividly is uh, Darth Vader saying, just saying reductively, you know, I'm not, I don't follow the old religion or that old religion. He's like trying to be critical of it. But in fact, uh, doctrinally, the, the Jedi believe that uh, you shouldn't yield to your, an your anger and rage and fear. You should uh, uh, conquer it. And, and as we know, if you're taught to go to the dark side, you have to embrace your anger and so on. But Darth Vader what a clarification. So, so on, there are a few instances in episode four specifically where it's called a Hopi religion or it's called an ancient religion, and it's twice. It's once by Han Solo and then once by the Imperial uh, captain or someone on the Death Star in the little round table that they have. Yeah. Neither times... Is it rejected or is it said, no, we're not a religion? Both times, Darth Vader and Obi Wan just kind of go with it. They don't say anything. They don't say, oh, we're not a religion. We're actually, you know, like, so. But Obi Wan like, let a lot of false statements go uncorrected. And that yeah, that's true. 
but he was, yeah, a, he really was a liar. Yeah, you really can't trust him. Yeah, we're going to find out a little bit. What a purpose. What, what Unless is you can't like go there choking him. That's just I mean, he's said, what is he saying? That's not the negative. We don't believe in your ancient religions. And he's like, <laughs> 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 it's like, now? Jesus, get that guy. <laughs> <laughs> Beat him over the head. Like, <laughs> oh, and he says, I find your lack of faith disturbing. So maybe yeah. it is. Mm, that kind of leads me to think it might be a religion. So Yeah, but a religion but, that is, that I believe has deeply integrated into the state. It's a regularly discussed and utilized, as you said, as a special forces, a religious special forces of the state. It, it's not a religion that requires faith, it requires midichlorians. And next slide. <laughs> <laughs> Did the Empire inadequately send troops to fight a religious, religious insurgents? Sorry. So the discussion of the discussion of a religious insurgency. Now we're we're of course going into episode four beyond. A so if we establish this at least loosely as a religion and as something that we were fighting for and used as a soldier of that religion, is the Empire sending troops in to go and squash this insurgency? Um, I, 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 I'm going to object to the premise of that question. It, it isn't a, a religious insurgency. You watch it. Uh, it, it, it it's a basic uh, fight against a tyrannical uh, government. The bulk of the folks fighting it aren't Jedi. They're just average folks. So I, I think it's more uh, in line with the traditional uh, revolution from a dictatorial government uh, Back to a path of freedom. I think that's a good point. I think that's that not a Jedi driven thing. They've pretty much by the time the rebellion comes to life, the Jedi have long since been. Yeah, they really go down like this to know that. Right. Like, like, Skywalker, like, yeah. Anakin Skywalker basically takes out what, you know, 20 or 30 or 40 Including the uh, children. younglings, yeah. Yeah, so he's, he's basically cutting it off its legs and saying, this is the last generation of Jedi to like, you know, my kids hide my children. You know, do not, I don't want to see them. They're the last of the Jedi. So they really do try to wipe it out. So it's hard to say it's a religious insurgency, even though I guess the elements of the Force are still there because they see a definite problem with Darth Vader as a Sith Lord. Well, I think that, so it's worth pointing out that in the first drafts of the script for Star Wars, or the Star Wars as it was called at the time, <laughs> um, Lucas in the second draft made an explicit reference to Vietnam as part of what to compare what the rebellion was to the American Empire. So and he was very political in thinking about Vietnam at the time because at the time, 74, 75, he wanted to he, he was very close to making Apocalypse now. Uh, Francis Ford Coppola and him were kind of going back and forth on making this and he kind of wanted to make that. He decided he was going to make his space opera, but there are parts of this that he wanted to put in there. So the insurgency is there with like meaningful political And this was historically in the in the 70s, we really hadn't started to, uh, as a nation, make uh, peace with the Vietnam era. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Just as a you know, as, as someone who, you know, studied pop culture and radio, television, and film, you really look at the turning point in America addressing the Vietnam era was a Magnum PI TV series yeah. in, in the 80s. Mm -hmm. Point of clarification? No. <laughs> <laughs> Just uh, but like something to bear in mind is in episode three after. You know, Darth Vader, I mean, everyone's seen Star Wars, no spoilers, whatever. So, <laughs> <laughs> so basically, you fly out the window, all his hands gone, whatever, rise, Darth Vader, blah, blah, blah. So Darth Sidious and Darth Vader are now officially the two Sith. Um, at this point, when he marches on the temple with the clones, um, it is an operation of the Empire. Like, it's no longer an operation under the Republic. It's the Empire doing that. So they send... Not inadequately, very adequately trained troops to fight religious insurgents, so to speak, because they completely wipe out, you know, every Jedi in the Jedi. That's order sixty six. Yeah, which is yeah. Im extremely impressive. So I, I think you very impressive. Yeah, I mean, the, I would say but you have to you have to distinguish that between between that uh, the, the rebellion that we started with with Episode Four. Right. And the rebellion that happened under the Republic with the Confederation, which uh, 
was driven by the trade, uh, officially uh, by the Trade Federation's uh, resistance to a tariff, but uh, we actually think that might have been crony capitalism representing something it was a else. Yeah. Um, it was a guild yeah. with a Senate seat, plus it had a secret agenda, which was the Sith agenda. Right. I also want to, on this, on this slide with the ISIS stuff, it is also worth pointing out that when the rebellion gets going, Later on, it starts on Tatooine, which is, I mean, or Tunisia, <laughs> which is a very, very sort of this is where rebellions rebellion start in frontiers and places where the Republic is not able to extend its power in places like Hoth. That's where rebellions start. And in uh, Tunisia. And, and also in, in Vietnam. And also, if you look at the American Revolution, you can read a bunch of journals from soldiers, British soldiers here, who just thought this was the most remote inhospitable place you could possibly be stationed and didn't really want to fight the war in the first place. So. To that point, Zach, next slide. Please keep your hands there. Oh, wait. Keep going, Matt. Go past those. Go past those. Is Tatooine a failed state or an ISIS plan? Yeah. No, it's more like the, you know, it's more like the green zone. I mean, it really is more like, uh, there's, there's definitely a projection of imperial force into Somalia. Tatooine. Somalia. You know, yeah, maybe Somalia like Somalia, yeah. yeah. It, I, I, I'm going to go with it. it. I mean, there's a there's a spaceport in it with the classic uh, cantina uh, scene. Uh, but what what it really is, I think, is you look back in in the early history of uh, you know, world history. It's really a, it's a trading outpost. Uh, uh, like, you know, like, like Wichita in the 1840s. It seems, it seems a lot like Casablanca. Yeah. Like it's sort of a romanticized little trading post, but yeah. what's outside of it is just a bunch of farmers and people going about their daily lives and they don't really consider too much about the rebellion. I know, I, I came to Tatooine for the water, <laughs> but there are no water that I stand for the beaches. Yeah, yeah. No, but I, I, I was missing four. <laughs> See, I think that, so from my perspective, because I study the history of states and everything a lot, like I think that the I'm gonna resist the premise a little bit because I don't know what Tatooine was like before. So I would call something like usually failed state means something like anarchy. Um, I would call North Korea a failed state too. So we need some sort of rubric where we can describe what something is between. Because if you were to ask me, would I prefer Tatooine to North Korea? I'd choose Tatooine. I would choose the huts over the uh, over the North Korean dictatorship. So there's so if you look at sort of the Somalia example, particularly if you look at PMs from GMU's work on Somalia, which is the question of whether or not it's better off now than it was under a horrible state. It's unclear whether or not it's better off now than a horrible state. So it's it's failed in some regards, but it might be better than it was. The same. Amy you had a question. Where the Empire makes a deal with them to send Han Solo over there. That's his job with the HUD is the yeah, is a robber baron. Crime lord, yeah. Crime lord, yeah. yeah. It's a it's a cartel. Maybe the yeah. maybe the uh, example would be the a, a country run by the equivalent of a of a drug cartel. And then they climbed up to Luke Skywalker, who I assume is a known renegade from the Empire, and they capture him and they're okay executing him almost on the path of the Empire. The Empire comes in and gets the huts to do some stuff, like give them Han, kind of like what they did with the Cloud City. And, and you'll probably collect that, that's it. Teaching you a fan? No, exactly. I'm going to go Wikipedia and I've heard out real quick. But, uh, I used to play a, uh, back in the day, this is a really fun game, uh, it, was a, it was an MMORPG, so it's similar to World Warcraft, it's called Star Wars Galaxies. Oh yeah. And oh, it's yeah. Like Star Wars Galaxies extensively. Um, you could go on Tatooine, and on Tatooine there were a few different cities, and there's Moss Eisley, which is shown in episode four, there's Moss Espa, which is where Anakin Skywalker is originally from, it's where Watto's junk shop is, where they're kind of where the pod races are usually held as well, um, or near there. Um, and then you have Bestine, and Bestine is the sort of like the de facto capital of Tatooine, so to speak. It's where all the administrative kind of dealings go on. And Bestine actually has an extensive imperial presence. There's not only an imperial base there. There's like tons of troops. The Imperial Academy, the flight school, kind of has trainings there. So there's definitely like those game know developers taking poetic license. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, it's it's from a game that that's, says that's that's by yeah, Lucas right the so it comes straight from George Lucas. Because they mentioned Bestine and the deleted scene. Mm -hmm. Right, but in, yeah, that's where they would go for training and. Bestine sounds like it's a planet. Right, exactly. Which is the confusion, but but what I was going to say was on top of this is that I think that 
Tatooine is uh, a failed state and that there may have been some kind of, not nation building, but in this case, planet building taking place on Tatooine, where the government's there, there's a military presence, occupation, possibly martial law, and yes, there might be crony capitalism because of the huts being there as well. So That always seems to me a little bit like Tatooine was a resource planet. So instead of being something that was taken over by the Empire, it was more like it was exploited by the Empire. It's a developing planet. Yeah, it's like, yeah, developing well, planet. Arrakis was like, clearly an influence on Tatooine. It's, it's, As a form of Arrakis. Right. Can we, I mean, can we t ruminate for a second on the absurdity of having a planet capital? This all goes back to the fact that these people need smaller, more localized government, and that's why the Empire <laughs> came along and said, "I'm going to direct your entire absurd like thing toward a toward a progress uh, in the future." I think yes. one of the other things that's important with Tatooine you have to notice is throughout the movies, it's one of the few places where they use like a different form of currency. Oh yeah, he yeah. says Republican. Yeah. Yeah. Republican yeah. 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 Like, yeah, first I one where they're there. there. And stuff like that. I think that may have something else. Oh, that, that says a lot to me from yeah. a libertarian yeah. standpoint. The Fed apparently yeah. doesn't extend very far. Yeah, yeah. the this collapse. Is, Fed. This is Bitcoin territory. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> or, 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 or else it's Greece. Yeah, exactly. Right. But I mean, like, yeah. if the, I mean, it's really kind of crazy because if you can redeem those Republic credits in all the Republic planets, then they have to be valuable. Yeah. I mean, just by definition, there has to be a monetary crisis going on in the Republic for the fact that he won't take Republican credits well, at some discount rate. Is, is the boss Isley cantina speakeasy? I mean, maybe they could track the money. Like right, the you know. Yeah, yeah, maybe they, uh, who knows? Is his boots on the ground? <laughs> <laughs> yes, it's not. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, they're putting boots on the ground to go find. That's basically, I mean, you mentioned that Bestine has a Republic presence, but I think all these droids are here. To find you know, those droids, <laughs> like, and there's almost never any droids in you and Moss Eisley. Yeah. Well, <laughs> otherwise, they would have been at the point of sale, right? Not wandering around Moss Eisley. They would have been when the the sand crawlers. Well, they went to the Jawas. And at this point, there were Imperials from. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Correct name. At this point. Well, I, I think that's right. But one of the things I, I and this is what raises questions for me about whether the stormtroopers are clones is that they're mostly the same height. We know that because Luke is shorter than they are. You're a little short for Stormtrooper. Uh, and, and so I think that because of the same height, they must have some clone dimension to them, even at this well, place. Maybe they're just height requirements. Well, I mean, even yeah, it's like the rock <laughs> <laughs> you know, Mark Hamill doesn't seem that short. <laughs> 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 the, reason, the reason that you argue against that is because there were so, okay, in the present canon, not counting the legend stuff, Clone Wars and Rebels are currently canon, and there's an entire two episode uh, arc that deals with the fact that stormtroopers are not clones because there's some of the clones from the Clone Wars era that are still around who pulled their chips out so that Order 66 wouldn't they wouldn't be affected by it, and they very they very. To seek me, make the uh, you, you said that before, you know, but you said that before, and I, I, I respect your right to believe that the Clone Wars are canon. <laughs> 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 Not everyone buys it. Depends on how that. old you are, I think. Like, if you're younger, the Clone Wars and Rebels are very I'm much. I'm just telling canon. you, in 1977, there were no Clone Wars. I'm too old for Clone Wars to be canon. I mentioned the Clone Wars a lot. Yeah. Oh, no, it was a great way to well, he mentions it twice. Here. By, by, by I'm not saying that there were no Clone Wars. Clone Wars. I'm just saying he's on the story. Clone Wars, the cartoon, I guess, or whatever. It's absolutely canon. You're right. No, I'm sorry. I just so we want to respect everyone's time here. I think we have one or two more. Oh, last question. Are Siths really just objective? Well, it seems clear that, I mean, it seems clear they're really motivated by uh, uh, selfishness. Uh, and but, but actually what I think of is, you know, there's the, there's the rule of two. So you have to have the master who's clearly Ayn Rand. And then you have the rebellious apprentice who's Nathaniel Brandon. And then, and then there's eventually a split that just happens, you know, among, uh, you know, among objectives. See, I know Rebecca totally loves this. <laughs> Uh, uh, and, and really, I just told that joke for Rebecca. I don't think I don't think using the the, the sort of intuitional elements of the force 
would be acceptable under Ayn Rand. It's not I, 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 Ayn Rand would not allow you to feel any sort of, uh, even though she did it constantly, she would not allow you to do that. So no, I don't think that they're, they're okay. I know. I'm just that way. like a traditional <laughs> evil, you're reading way too much into it. <laughs> <laughs> We've been doing that for about an hour and a half. <laughs> I feel like it's okay, I've been sitting on the house floor. <laughs> Galactic domination goes beyond just satisfying my own selfish needs, although there have been occasions. So I, I don't know. I really don't know. So we want we, we want to respect everyone's time here, but we have one since since Congressman was was late, and since there have been a ton of great conversations, do we have one final question from the audience uh, that the panel can answer, starting with the congressman? Yes, sir. Your favorite Star Wars characters, and they can be from the expanded universe because I don't accept these these jokes. You said they can. They can be. Can be? Okay. okay, absolutely. I mean, I've uh, that's a I, I have not actually uh, actually thought about that. I'm. I was always kind of a, uh, a, a Han Solo swashbuckler type uh, fan. I'm, I'm, I'll, I'll pick Han Solo, but reserve the right to think about it and change my mind. <laughs> Mara Jade. Uh, salacious Crumb. Or, <laughs> um, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a really big fan of Wicked. Oh yeah! <laughs> oh. Like I'm a really big fan of Wicked. Like, so and I, I, some people hate Ewoks. I never understood why people hate Ewoks. So. <laughs> I'll, I'll explain it to you. Man. I accept. <laughs> so there we go. Talk about Second Amendment rights. You don't even need Second Amendment to defeat the Empire. You just need logs. On the ropes. <laughs> <laughs> so make sure the government, like, you know, so out of my dead, uh, out of my cold dead hands, like with a log and a rope. <laughs> I would, have to, I would have to say, yo, 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 yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely Jar Jar Binks. Uh, okay. So thank you all so very much for, I guess, joining what should probably be a series on politics and Star Wars. Anybody, any Same papers? Next year? Can we, can we seriesize this? Well, that's uh, a year, two weeks after we A year from now, there'll be Star Wars Rogue One. Yeah. I know, we can yeah. have yeah. fan fiction, a lot of fan yeah. <laughs> Well, I mean, we could, yeah, do this three weeks from now. And <laughs> Thank you, thank you, Congressman, for being here. And support the Yoda Act. Yoda. 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 Absolutely. You need to own your own device. You missed Dark Norquist. I saw Dark Norquist in the elevator. Eli, I wanted to read this quote to you about because of the nationalism thing. So Count Dooku in Attack of the Clones, which unfortunately I also watched recently, uh, says, let me remind you of our absolute commitment to capitalism of lower taxes, reduced tariffs, and the eventual abolition of all trade barriers. Now, I don't know if he's actually just trying to plan his own little thing, but like, that's what Count Dooku tells him once the trade federation is on back to work. So, oh, maybe the empire is free market. They're setting you up for the trade. By the people who actually do establish the authority of the empire. Because he believed in free so, trade. Yeah. <laughs> but he is. Count Dooku is a Pinochet. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Yell it out, yell it out. <laughs> He's sort of yeah, like the. I just wanted to know what was the impact on the Star Wars universe had been if lightsabers and X Wings were subject to restrictive and visa licenses? <laughs> there would be a lot of flickering, I think. <laughs> yeah. Now, you certainly would not have been able to modify your droids, and we would not have had yeah. nearly as an interesting as 3CPO in uh, R2D2. Because uh, yeah. young Anakin Skywalker would have been breaking all sorts of licensing agreements, <laughs> hacking with those. Uh, those droids. No, the, the open source, as I said in my opening remarks, the open source nature of the X-Wing is the key reason that the rebels can destroy the Death Star. So with restrictive licensing agreements, it, it simply would not be possible to destroy the Death Star. Think of it as the Linux win. <laughs> <laughs> Well, can you write that? Yeah. 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 Y
are individually owned and controlled. And the ARCO unit. Why do you think they call them droids? <laughs> Androids play the that works. They did. Like they made, I mean, that's unbelievable, but it's just <laughs> <laughs> Thank you all. Thank our panelists.